I'm going to get into the message, Genesis chapter 2, look in verse number 18, Genesis 2, verse number 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help me for him. Verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken for man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I'm going to preach on this subject tonight, the second most important decision of your life, the second most important decision of your life. An unusual thing happened in 1995. My dad was the senior pastor of Blessed Hope Baptist Church. I was his assistant pastor at that time. And my dad wanted to have Dr. Lee Robertson come and preach at our church. It had been one of his dreams, so he contacted Brother Robertson and honestly was a bit surprised when he agreed to come to a little town, Jasonville, Indiana. But Brother Robertson was such a godly man and such a gracious man, I guess maybe we shouldn't have been surprised. And so he preached a meeting for us, and my job was to kind of host him. And that meant that by the t- when he arrived at church, I was to make sure that he was well taken care of, him and his wife needed anything, and then just to stay close by, just to you know, run interference for him and try to be a blessing, see to his needs. And so at the end of the Sunday morning service, all of the people had left. It was me and Dr. Lee Robertson. We were in the middle aisle of the Blessed Hope Baptist Church, just the two of us by ourselves. And he turned around and he said, Brother Jerry, tell me again what you do here. And I said, well, uh, uh, several things, but I'm mostly, I guess you'd say, the youth pastor, and I oversee our Christian school. And as soon as he heard that I was involved with youth, he reached over, and you got to understand, he was in his 90s at this time and had uh, long since not, uh, moved on to pastor emeritus status and just traveled the country. But, but I can see him re- reaching out with that gnarled hand and grabbing my elbow and, and just gripping it. And boy, he still had strength in his grip. And he pulled me close by and he said, Brother Jerry, he said, we're losing our young people. He said, they're marrying out of the will of God. And of all the things that man could have said, all of the experience that he had, I can feel it on my elbow right now, that grip tightening. And he looked at me again and said, Brother Jerry, you need to do something about that. And I couldn't help but kind of laugh. I thought, sure, Dr. Lee Robertson, I'll just take care of that tomorrow, you know. I'll send a memo out. People will stop doing that. But he gripped my elbow and he said, you need to do something about that. He said, they're growing up in good Christian homes, even in Christian schools. And he said, when the devil can't seem to get him any other way, he said, right when we about get him to the finish line, he'll bring somebody into their life that's not the will of God. We're losing our young people. We're losing our young people. Some of you have already asked me the question as we were talking, you know, is God not calling young people anymore? Surely the need for preachers and any of us that travel know that that need is everywhere. Go to the Northwest and you know what they're saying? We need preachers. Talk to Jim Townsley out on the East Coast. We need preachers. Talk to Paul Chapman. Save New England. We need preachers. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's in the Midwest, rural America. Let me just say, we need preachers. People can criticize California and being out of the Midwest. I guess we feel an obligation to do that. But you know what? I was reading a book a while back on the California gold rush, and halfway through I just slammed it shut, fell on my knees and said, God, give us a California gospel rush. We can complain about it, or we can send some young men out there to do something about it. I kept thinking to myself, well, where, where are these young men? And I'm convinced, please hear me out tonight, that the way the devil gets many a young man long before he can surrender to the call of preach is that he lures him away from the, God's perfect will by sending, by the devil sending, I should say, the devil sending a counterfeit 
into his life before God can send the real deal. And it seems like young people are falling for it. Not one or two here, but almost by the droves. By the truckload, they're marrying out of the will of God. And that 95-year-old preacher, I mean, one of the most godly men I've ever had time, got to spend time with, can hold onto my elbow and not let go and grip harder and look me in the eye. I got to feel like, Brother Robertson, I'm going to try to do something about it tonight. I want to try to help you young people. The minute I mentioned this subject, for some of you, you just automatically threw defenses up. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to trust me. I'm going to ask you to just lower those defenses for the next few minutes and just listen to somebody that loves you. Some of you young ladies, I want you to let me grandpa you a little bit tonight. Some of you young men, I want you to let me help you because I believe that the second most important decision that you'll ever make in your life is who you marry. I think it'll have more bearing on what you're able to accomplish for the Lord or what you're unable to accomplish for the Lord Amen. than almost any other decision you can make. Amen. Now, if it's the second most important decision, let's just take 60 seconds and let's talk about the first most important decision. What is that? Salvation. Amen. Receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. When we all came in here tonight and we're going to gather together and we're going to enjoy this and join together in this, but it's, it's unique, you know, you'll never have these same people in one place ever again, it's just like, this is it. When we all walked in, there's three groups that walked in the door, and I can promise you this is true. There's those of you that know for sure, 100% sure, you could give a good Bible reason, you got a solid salvation testimony, no doubt in your heart you know you're saved. There's some young people that know, I mean, come on, down in your heart you know you're lost. You know you need to be saved. But there's also, almost in every crowd like this, a middle group that just says, Preacher, I'm struggling with, and that's why I was so appreciative of that testimony. Sometimes I think I am, sometimes I think I'm not. How do you know the difference between Holy Spirit convicting you that you're not saved, or the devil trying to get you to doubt your salvation? And, and you know what? I've been kind of caught in the middle. Now listen, young people. By the time this conference is over, what we'd like to do is take this group, and this group, and let's move all of the young people over into this group where you know for sure, without a doubt, Amen. that you're going to heaven. Amen. That is the most important decision you'll make. So stop just for a minute. Let's mark this moment in time. This exact moment in time. Let's mark it. All right, draw a line. Let's mark it. The timeline of your life from the time you're born all the way to this moment. Now, I want you to, in your mind and heart, search up and down that timeline. Can you find a place in your memory where you fell under Holy Spirit conviction because of your sin? You felt the drawing of the Father. Jesus said, hey, no man can come unto me unless the Father draw him. What's so fascinating about this is when God wants to save somebody and is attempting to get you saved, you realize that all members of the triune God stop everything they're doing and they concentrate their full efforts on you. The Father's drawing you, drawing you, but he won't push you, he won't make you, but he'll draw you. Come on, you remember? You may not have known what that was. Can you remember some of you that are saved? Preacher, I remember sitting out there and holding on to the pew and I, I can remember this inside of me that's urging, urging that I need to go forward, I need to do something about my lost condition. That was the drawing of the Father. Conviction of the Holy Spirit and understanding of the gospel. You had to understand the gospel. And it's not complicated. It's not hard. I mean, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, you're willing to say out loud, I believe that Jesus is the Lord. He's the Son of God. I believe he died for my sins, was buried, rose again. Preacher, I believe it not just with my head, but with my heart. Under conviction of sin, with the drawing of the Father, and understanding the gospel, crying out, asking Christ to save you. Listen, it's not complicated, it's not hard, but it's 1,000% necessary. I'm not for getting a bunch of Christian kids together and trying to get them to doubt their salvation. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. But if you do not have a salvation that can hold up to a Holy Bible, Holy Ghost examination, you need to get one before you leave this conference. That's the first and most important decision you'll make. Let's look at the Bible. Let me see if I can help you with some things. 
God, in verse number 18, looked down and he watched Adam. The Bible says as he has observed Adam, he said something. It is not good that man should be alone. That does not surprise me because I is a man. I think the Lord put him in the garden, sat back, watched that for a while and went, eh, that ain't going to work. That's not going to work. We're going to have to... We're going to have to get him some help. He's going to need some help. And so, God decided that he would make Eve. Now, I'm just going to tell you, and we're not going to spend much time at all on verse 19 and 20, because I don't understand verse 19 and 20. And um, there's parts of the Bible I don't understand. I've studied them for years, and I don't understand them. And I, I go to them. I think it's humorous. If somebody has Bible knowledge on this, insight, I'm sure somebody does in this Many people probably can help me afterwards. I'll be back there, and you can help me with this. But, okay, so I'm, I'm going to make him and help me for him. And then the Bible talks on verse 19 how God, you know, formed every beast and field and fowl of the air. And, and then he brought him to Adam, you know, and Adam called every living creature. That was, that, that was the name thereof. Verse 20, and Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. Got anything? All I want to do is say this tonight. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, if the hippo would have come through and he went, hey, baby. <laughs> I don't know what our kids would look like, man. I have no idea. The giraffe comes by. All I know, I, come on, did, is that what it says? All right, that's why we're not touching it, okay? I have no idea what that means. Go ask your preacher at home. You're, I have no idea. Uh, but again, Adam, thank you! Hey, Amen, praise God. <laughs> wow, could have been weird. Okay, verse 21. So what did God do? Think about this. Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Now I'm going to give you several things. Let me give you some principles that will help you. Think about this. Number one, during your teenage years, you will, you will battle feelings of incompleteness. Every single one of us that went through those years, every single one of you at time to from time to time will battle against feelings of incompleteness. You ever feel like just something's missing? You ever feel a loneliness even when you're around other people? Just like you're not whole. Let me tell you why. You're not whole. It's interesting when we get down to verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One, One flesh. Well, I'm fairly good in math, and one plus one is always two, except in marriage. The Bible calls it, in Ephesians, a great mystery. But you know why? It's not bad math. It's because you, when God made you as a young man, he made you incomplete. He's the one that looked down and said, it's not good for man to be alone. And so you're not whole, young ladies. You're not a complete one. And so you're going to battle these feelings of incompleteness as you grow up. And you know what? I want you to know this. As an adult, we understand that. Okay? Your mom and dad understand that. They went through it. Your preacher understands it. Um, God understands it. Hallelujah. He's the one that made us. But I want to tell you somebody else that understands it. The devil understands it. And if he understands from time to time you're going to fight these feelings of incompleteness, something's missing. Preacher, something's missing. No, someone's missing. Someone's missing. And you know what? God's got that person for you, which brings you to number two. Man, if I can get everybody in this room to believe this, we could win the battle on this thing. Number one, during your teenage years, you will battle against feelings of incompleteness. Number two, God has created someone just for you. God has created someone just for you. God has created someone just for you. Now, I know that there is, and let me just say this, the very rare exceptions where God creates some people, I think, to live a celibate life. And I think all of us know those type of people, but 
we would certainly all agree that that is a small, tiny fraction for most everyone in this room. When God was creating you within a certain time frame of when he was creating you in your mother's womb, he was also creating someone for you. And that person that he's creating for you is just for you. Look at verse number 18. He said, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. If you study that phrase there, what it literally means is I will make him a helper uniquely designed for him, a perfect fit for him. Now God has a plan and God's created someone just for you. My wife was born in South Dakota, November of 1961, two months before she was born in August of 1961, I was born in Greencastle, Indiana. Listen, folks, I don't know why we believe God is so specific and everything else, and then this is just happenstance. I mean, his will in every other area is so precise, and yet he just threw a bunch of humans on the planet, a bunch of young people, and said, just mill around and try to figure it out, and what, whoever you land with will pick up your life from there. I don't believe that God is purposeless. I think the one who created this universe, and it runs on absolute precision, is, is precise enough to make someone for you. Someone for you. Now you think about that. Here's a young lady, my wife. She's up here in the balcony. I'm so glad she could be here tonight. And I will go ahead and say this out loud. Someone said, what's the best thing you ever got from Howells Anderson College? Her! Her! And there's not even a close second. I got a diploma somewhere. If you gave me a couple days, I could look through enough boxes and find it. But I know where she is, brother. I know where she is. By the way, I hit the wife lottery. I'm, I'm going to try to teach you how to do that. I mean, the greatest blessing outside of salvation that God's ever brought into my life is that woman right up there. You dust for fingerprints anything that I've ever succeeded at, and you'll find her fingerprints on it somewhere. I mean, we're a team. We're in this together. We are one. By the way, that person for you is worth waiting for. It's worth, he or she is worth waiting for. Write this down. Number three, in God's time, he will bring that person to you. In God's time, he will bring that person to you. Notice what it says in verse number 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken for man made he a woman. Listen, folks, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. These phrases that we want to just run past and act as if they don't exist, they teach us a Bible principle. Young people, look right up here. I am tired of investing my life for 18 years as a young person and watch the devil snatch him out using this dirty trick. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. It doesn't have to be. Please listen to what I'm saying. The Bible is very purposeful here. It says, and brought her unto the man. Who did? God did. God did. So, let me tell you what did not happen. Look in the Bible. Double check. I'm going to make sure the preacher's sticking to the word of God. How many ribs did he take out? How many women did he make? Did he take five ribs? Make five women. Say, hey, why don't you just date around whichever one you like? By the way, I'm glad he didn't take five ribs. Most of us need all our ribs to kind of hold them. What we're trying to hold in here, you know. So. Come on. One. Man, I, 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 I honestly, if it would help, would get on my knees and beg you to listen to me right now. This is not happenstance. Okay? In God's time, God will bring that person to you. Now, this then requires something from us. We have to be willing to trust God in this area of our life. And young people, this entire issue is about trust. I mean, why, come on young ladies, let me talk to just a handful of you. Why, why are you so boy crazy? 
Why do you spend all your time chasing boys and chasing boys? And I mean, tripping all over yourself, just trying to get everybody's attention. Chasing, chasing. You know what? Let me tell you why. I'm not mad at you. Let me tell you why. Because you think you have to do it. You don't trust him. You don't believe what I'm saying enough just to trust God and say, God's got this figured out. Listen, your teenage years should not be about pursuit. It should be about preparation. And it's real easy to switch over to that, Brother Joe, once we really trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Amen. Lean not to thine own understanding. Preacher, I'm not sure I understand this. If you always understood, listen, if you understood it, you wouldn't have to trust. Trust is only necessary when you don't understand. Amen. Well, preacher, I don't know, and I can't see it. And what if I miss it? Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Come on. God formed you in your mother's womb. Jeremiah chapter 1, King James Holy Bible. If he formed Jeremiah for specific purposes, then he formed you for specific purpose, purposes and for a specific person. But you've got you to gotta buy into it. Now once you do, it just causes, watch this, you can just kind of relax. This whole teenage romance roller coaster, one dead in race relationship after another. You know, why, why don't you just stop buying tickets to that roller coaster? Why don't you just get off of it? Amen. Listen, why don't you focus on relationships that you know now are sanctioned by God and are timely in your life as a teenager? How about your relationship with the Lord? Amen. Come on, how, much, how about your relationship with your parents? How about your relationship with your spiritual leaders? I mean, if we made that the focus in our teenage years and took this other thing, and let me have you look in verse number 21. And the Lord caused a what? Deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he slept. Young lady, young man, listen to me. Some of you need to go to sleep in this area of your life. You need to go to sleep. I, I mean, you need to come up here to the altar. I mean, you know, good night, you're 14. Why are you shopping? You're going to get married the next year? Come on, Mr. Casanova. Ever since you've got here, your entire focus has been how many phone numbers you can get from some airhead girls that are dumb enough to give them to you. You know what your problem is? Listen, you know what your problem is? Trust. i got to make this happen. I'm going to take control of this decision. So you spend your entire teenage years focused on a bunch of dead-end relationships. And by the way, I've never seen someone, a girl that's boy crazy or a boy that's girl crazy in those years that had a good relationship with their mom and dad. And a close walk with the Lord. If I'm wrong, help me out, brother. Amen. I think the devil's distracting you. Amen. If you really believe it, then you know what? You can just kind of take a breath say, you know what? Watch this. If God has made someone so special that, that he made him just for me, and we're going to be a perfect fit, when they come into my life, I want to be prepared for that relationship. So as a teenager, what I want to do is spend my life preparing for that moment so that I'll be the best husband for that woman that God made for me. Amen. Okay? So young men, start preparing. You start setting down. Come on, it's time to grow up. See, you sit down with dad and say, Dad, what's it take to pay the bills in this household? All right? Some of you need to experience something that some of you 16, 17 never have experienced. It's called a J-O-B. You might want to experience that. Son, you can't get married until you make marrying money. McDonald's ain't burying money. Uh, all right, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna tiptoe into this area and tiptoe back out. All right, just so you know, I'm just tiptoeing. All right, come on, preachers, come on, youth pastors. Why do we say this is the most important thing, and then we don't spend any time helping our young people get ready for the second most important thing in their life? 
I mean, you don't know how to pay bills. You don't know how to save. You don't never earned a dollar. And, oh, but you don't understand. I'm going to be an NBA star. We got our, yeah, and by the way, I'm, I'm all for sports. All right, you know what? As long as you remember it's a game. They call it a game. Hey, we're going to practice for tomorrow night's game. All right, it's a game. There's some things you can learn from sports, but listen to me, this whole idea that playing volleyball and playing basketball is preparing you for marriage. Okay, let me act this out, all right? So, you finally meet the one. Woo! Fireworks. And all of a sudden, it's... Ah! And then you set the date, and you get married, and you do the honeymoon. Woo! And then you come back. And uh, you get that new first house or apartment. And that young man's going to get up the next morning bright and early, and he's going to go sit down at the breakfast table. He's going to have a fork and a spoon. He's going to be sitting there. And the young lady's going to come walking in. What do you want? Breakfast. I want breakfast. 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 Come on, gentlemen, what are you going to want? Uh, let's get specific on this. Come on, what do you want? Bacon? Bacon and eggs? What's that? I don't even know what that is. Chorizo? Chorizo? Biscuits and gravy! Biscuits and gravy! And you young lady's gonna go. Hold on. And you're gonna run in your bedroom, you could go through the closet, you're gonna bring your volleyball out, and you're gonna go. <laughs> and he's gonna go. That's good. Biscuits and gravy. You guys having a good time? You're about not to. She's going to go over to the pantry and she's going to open it up and say, Groceries. Groceries. Money for groceries. And you're going to sit there going, Hold on. And you're going to run with the same closet and you're going to get your basketball. You come out. <laughs> and she's going to point to J O B, job, groceries. Now I'm trying to help you. I, I, I want you to have fun. Some of you have way too much fun. You think teenage years is some big party. Think at 18, some switch is going to flip and you're going to show up to Bible college and you're going to be able to hold down a job and balance a checkbook and you're not getting ready. You're not getting ready for what is the second most important relationship you're ever going to have in your life. Now why in the world should God send you a tremendous young lady if you're not ready for one? Now think about it. God's created someone special just for you in God's time he will bring that person to you I'm going to tell you what I believe and you talk to your pastor and your parents and hey whatever they say go with it but I'm going to tell you something I just discourage this whole teenage dating thing I, it's nothing but a bunch of waste of time and it ends in tragedy more times than not okay God's, God's going to bring the person to you Amen. in his time. Amen. So focus on what's important. Focus on developing your character, your work ethic. Come on. Well, I mean, have a strong relationship with the Lord. Young man, instead of chasing girls, get on a bus and 
Chase down some bus kids and fill the bus up. Go to your pastor and say, I want to be your soul winning partner. I need to learn these things. Sit down with your dad. Teach me how to budget. Teach me how to pay the bills. Teach me how to listen. Are we serious about this? Oh, but brother Ross, you don't understand all of this dating and breaking up and relationship breaking up, you know, dating and all this. That, that's relationship practice. No, that's divorce practice. The teenage years should not be about pursuit, but, by prepara- but, but about preparation and purity. Now, let me give you the next one, number four. The devil will bring a counterfeit into your life before God brings his perfect choice. I talked about going to sleep, but you know what the devil's going to do? He's going to try to wake you up. Yeah, he's going to try to wake you up. He's going to bring things into your life to try to feed on that feeling of incompleteness. You know, there's a lot of reasons not to listen to the wrong kind of music, but some of you, the reason that you listen to what you listen to is you are constantly stirring up those feelings and those emotions, and you're just making yourself a a target for the devil to bring the wrong kind of person into your life. Young ladies, again, let me just help you personally for just a minute. We've helped a lot of young ladies in our life, me and my wife. And You know, if you're coming from a home that's a less than ideal situation, maybe you don't have a dad or he's kind of absentee, and a lot of the love that you ought to be naturally getting from your mom and your dad, and it's not happening in your life, you're going to have to be extra careful. Extra careful. Young lady's name was Stephanie. She reached our bus ministry, and then she eventually came to our Christian school, and her dad was out of the picture. Her mom was a, you know, came to the church, but, when, you know, wasn't stable in her Christian life. So she listens to, by the way, she, bought, she, she got to stay in the cash, so she got the seven royal laws of courtship, and on her own, without parents making her, decided this is important enough, I'm going to implement these principles into my life. You know what she did? She came out of the public school, came into our Christian school, I'm turning that completely off, I'm putting that in God's hands, graduated from high school, came to me and my wife and sat down. Oh, I hope some of you are listening. I'm sa- I can save some of your lives right now. I can save some of your lives right now. She came and sat down, little tears running down her face. Sweet little girl. She said, I'm getting ready to go off to Bible college. I know even at Bible college I could make the wrong decision. I'm just not confident enough in this area of my life. Preacher, would you mean, you and Mrs. Ross just kind of went, if a young man starts showing interest, I've got to point him to someone. I love my dad. I love my mom, but I, they don't know. Would you help me? And you know what God did? God brought a young man into her life. And you know what the first thing he had to do? By the way, that guy that's asking for your phone number, give him your daddy's phone number. No, just, you know, come on. You can can turn the charm on in the smile. Oh, you want my phone? Okay, here. This dude's going to call. Hey, baby. What do you want? (laughs) So... You know what this young man did? He went and talked to her and said, I'd really like to maybe you to go out on a date with me. Here's my pastor's number. Would you call him? And, and then once he calls me, I'll talk to you about this again. Oh, I'm not going to. I know. I know. You know, nobody's going to tell you. Come on. You're the smartest person in any room. You forgot more than your mom and dad know. No, the honest truth is, Young lady, you can be so easily manipulated, emotionally manipulated, that, it's, that everybody can see it but you. And you need to knock that pride down. Excuse me, it wasn't Adam that was deceived in the garden, it was Eve. That's okay to say. Come on, man, I need to see some amens. The air should have left the room. You shouldn't have had to look at your wife to see if you could say amen right there. There are certain things that men are more susceptible to. And you know, it's amazing how God gifts our wife to guard us in those areas. And there are certain things that women are more susceptible to. Make them bad and us good or vice versa. It's just King James Holy Bible. Okay? So we can say it out loud. And if we don't say it out loud, you're not going to believe it. 
But young man, you know what? You can be manipulated too. I've watched a lot of young men, strong young men, dedicated young men. I thought, man, they're going to do great things for God. Watch this. They followed a mini skirt or a tight pair of blue jeans right out of the will of God. Say, where are those preachers at? Well, they ain't preaching now. No matter what God's plan was, they'll never get back on track from that. Hey, aren't you glad, Brother Joe, that growing up we could make some kind of dumb mistakes and decisions and, you know, we look back and go, oh my goodness. That's why David said, forgive me the sins of my youth, you know, stupid stuff. And we can recover from them and learn from them. But you get this wrong. That's right. Done. Come on. How many times have you sat in your office trying to help a young man, a young woman, or a young couple, and in the back of your mind you know you can't say it, but you're saying, you know why these people are going to eternally have marriage problems? Yeah. Right. Because they didn't believe that book. That's right. By the way, whoever you're married to, you're married to. Till death do you part. It don't give you an out. But young people, you're not married. You've got your whole life ahead of you. You can get this right. I mean, you know what? I don't even know how to describe it. There's no words for me to describe what a wonderful relationship it is when it is right. Brother, I love serving God, but you know what I love more than serving God? Going home at the end of the day from serving God. Amen. Amen. Serving God with her. Now, young ladies, again, here, I'm going to throw a lifeline out. And listen to it. Look right up here. But I struggled with enough to preach this, Brother Works. I struggled. And God wouldn't let me get away from it. There are young ladies sitting right here that because of the technology, because of the phone or the device you have, you are involved in a secret relationship with a guy, and your mom and dad doesn't even know about it. And I don't mean one or two or three of you. And you are this close to ruining your life. And you're feeling so much you can't even think straight. But if you'll stop and listen just for a minute to that still small voice, the Holy Spirit is screaming, He's right! You are this close. Slip it out of your window one night and you know what? There's some things once you break you can't put back together. R.G. Lee says you can't put an egg back together once you step on it. Doesn't mean that people that's made mistakes and bad choices, God can't pick them up, clean them up, and get them on a good path. But I'm going to tell you something. By the way, I'm going to tell you this. The Lord's second best will is still 10,000 times than the devil's best. But young people, you're there. You're sitting there. You don't have to settle for that. Man, do it right. There's some of you young men, you are in a relationship with a girl right now, and everything that I'm t saying is 100% hitting you right in the heart, and down deep in your heart, yeah, you're twitter pated but if you just stepped away from your emotions and took a hard look at that situation, that relationship, you know, you know that's going to take you out of God's will. Might not be the right person, watch this, might not be the right time. Well, here's the question. Can you trust the Lord with it? Amen. I mean, that's really the question. Can I believe that God loved me enough? Oh, don't we all have the same heart on this? There's no time to do it. But I promise you, with all of my heart, I would love to be able to block off, you know, the next 60 hours and have a room and have one kid at a time walk in there and sit down with me and my wife and look them in the eye and just take a minute or two and try to convince them how much God loves them. And how important they are. And what an incredible plan he has for them. And you need to hear that. No, I'm not talking about the other girls in the youth group. I'm talking about you. The one the devil has convinced that God doesn't love. He loves you. And he has a great life planned for you. And the devil hates it. And so he's going to send the wrong kind of guy. Come on, guys. He's going to send the wrong kind of girl. I got to say this in this day and age. Sometimes he's going to try to confuse you. Consider even, come on, girls on girls, guys on guys. I'm not going far down that road. Listen, the devil will do anything he can to try to get you and keep you from, from fulfilling this incredible purpose. Incredible. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. 
Yeah, guess what? There was that day when God came along, and you know what he did? He kicked Adam. Wake up, son. Huh? Wake up. Time to wake up. And Adam stood up. Here is God's gift. Forever gift. So, you know what? 15 years of age, Jerry Ross makes his way to an altar. I'm done with this. This is stupid. The whole guy, girl. You know what? Either God's God and he's got this figured out, or what am I doing? That's going to be set over here, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to focus on God's will, God's plan, the right relationships. And, and you know what, young men? If you will figure out where God's will is, and you'll just head down that road, somewhere along that road there's going to be a delightful collision. And guess what? Who knew that there was a young lady at a church camp? That went to an altar as a teenage girl and said, I ain't doing this. All the other girls in the youth group, they want to chase around, they want to do all this, but I ain't doing it. God, I just believe you love me more than that. I believe you've got something better. And here's this little baby that's born in a hospital in South Dakota, and this big fat, 10 pounds, 10 ounces. Big fat. Brother, I was born a man. Big fat. My dad didn't carry me out. He dribbled me out like that, you know. So. <laughs> Big fat baby boy in Green Castle. <laughs> I don't know what part she amen, so I'm not sure how to react. But. but God can just take their lives and just keep them underneath the umbrella of their parents and in the right kind of churches and going to the right kind of conferences and making the right kind of decisions and all of a sudden, on a bus route in Howes Anderson College, I get on the afternoon bus to go pick up the night bus riders, and I plop down on a seat and turn around, and I look this girl in the eye and say, Hello, what's your name? And then I ask her out. And you know what? I don't know how to explain it. But it's almost like you don't know them, but you've always known them. I'm going to say something really spooky. This is where I get in trouble sometimes. Did God take his rib and put it in her? I think there's a part, young man of you, inside the one that God's made for you. And I think if you'll be patient, trust God, listen to godly counsel. Do you hear what that man said? How many of you enjoy hearing Brother Joe Brown? How many are you glad Brother Joe Brown is pastor up there and doing God's use of him? You hear what his daddy said to him? I guarantee you, about two thirds of the crowd when you said that bristle. And you even said it. That's in all of us, brother. I'm just gonna I'm putting you on the spot. Would you be sitting here? What do you want? You want to just cling on to your stubbornness? I'm going to have my way and I'm going to prove it. I'll show everybody. Romeo and Juliet. Ah! <laughs> have you read the end of the story? <laughs> Stupid. And they lived happily ever after until they blew their brains out. <laughs> Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.